All right, everybody, here is the time. We have our biology exam coming up tomorrow, the official biology, biology exam. Everyone in the world is going to be taking paper one and paper two tomorrow. You've got a weekend for the first time in a long time, and then you can do paper three on Monday. So here are some last minute tips for you to prepare. Um, some of this stuff will be kind of obvious. Your teachers have been telling you all this stuff for a long time, but hopefully you'll get something out of this and uh, a final message at the end. The point is here is that the syllabus, the biology syllabus, has not changed for seven years. And even before that, it was hardly, hardly different. So biology content really hasn't changed. And yet IB has to keep coming up with different ways to keep asking the same questions. So keep that in mind. All the things that you've been practicing, it's the same content. But they need to still stay reputable and uh, you guys are smart. You can figure out how to find all these questions online and stuff like that. So with all these available questions to you, why isn't everyone just acing it all the time? Well, the people who are designing these questions are also thinking the same way. And so they're coming up with different ways to ask the same question. They know how you are thinking. They know what you've been practicing. They know that when you see a question like this, you want to calculate something like you start thinking, oh, I need to calculate magnification. It's image size over actual size. And so students get caught up on this question. Believe it or not, this is, uh, you can pause it and try this question if you haven't tried it already before. But uh, many students will try to approach this by writing down the equation for magnification when actually a seventh grader can solve this question without knowing anything about how to calculate magnification. Because in the end, all this is asking you is, how long is this actual cell? They tell you, here's a little scale here, so you literally have to just use your finger, pinch it to this size, and see how many times it fits. Turns out this bar fits about seven times, and then you can calculate that to be 70 micrometers. Then all you gotta do is convert micrometers to millimeters, and then you're done. But the syllabus specifically asks students to be able to calculate magnification, so they know you'll be practicing that, and this actually tripped up a bunch of different students. So approach a question with common sense. So look at the question like it's asking you a regular question, like you've never seen this stuff before, and uh, you'll be better equipped. Don't automatically switch into, oh, this is what I do, oh, this is what I do, um, even though I'm going to give you some tips on how to do some automatic approaches to multiple choice questions and things like that. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about all of this stuff. All right, so now we take a look at multiple choice questions. One of my favorite things to talk about because as a teacher or as an educator, multiple choice questions, which will be found primarily in paper one. At the end of this, I'll give you all the details you need to make sure you don't forget what you think you're going to forget or make a big fat boo-boo and uh, lose a bunch of points. Why do multiple choice questions have such a bad reputation? Teachers are like, oh, I don't, it's not good to give multiple choice questions because, you know, it's, it's, it's just me being lazy. But then some teachers like doing that. But my thing is, the secret about these multiple choice questions is that, yeah, they have a bad reputation primarily because they don't require the student to really do anything except for click or tick or draw an X through a single letter. That's all they need to do. That's all they need to demonstrate. But... It actually requires the students to do a lot of mental work to arrive at the correct answers. So yeah, it's kind of, you know, I don't know, it saves some time. You know, I think the, the science exams are the only ones in IB that actually have these multiple choice questions, I think. Um, they're still there. I don't know. Maybe one day they'll get rid of them. If you're doing higher level, you have one hour to do 40 questions. Standard level, you have 45 minutes to do 30 questions. You've learned about this, obviously, if you've taken any kind of SAT prep court prep course I did a long time ago. Process of elimination, absolutely, you need to practice it. If you don't cross out wrong answers and you're just trying to do it all in your head, you are being very, very silly or overconfident and you're just showing off to nobody. So you need to cross out wrong answers. But you got to get to those wrong answers by using uh, some techniques. So one thing, especially when you get well, any kind of question, try to figure out the answer. Try to understand what the question is asking before you even look at the answers. So I'm not going to go through these specific questions, but I've deliberately removed the answers A, B, C, and D here. The question says what information can be concluded from this karyotype? And you can try to study it and be like, okay, I see the correct number of chromosomes, so nothing funky going on. There's 46 chromosomes, so no down syndrome, no chromosome abnormalities. 
the sex chromosomes here are different. It must be XY, therefore this must be a boy or a male that doesn't have Down syndrome. And then I go and look into the answer choice and see if I can find something resembling what I just mentally figured out. And you'll actually be a lot more prepared when you reach those multiple choice answers, trust me. Plus, another thing that can happen is you read through the multiple choice question and you don't fully understand it, but you feel like the right thing to do is to go ahead and read through all the answers. And so you go ahead and read through the answers before you fully understand the question and it just causes you to lose confidence. Like, you just get more confused and you feel like, oh, there's no way I'm going to get to this. It, I, what do I do? What do I do? And then, so you skip it and you move on to the next question. So try to work through the question before looking at the answers. Another thing, and I've heard some of my own students talk about how this really helps them. When you arrive at the correct answer and you're like, ah, oh, it's got to be B, it's got to be B, go through the rest of them with the process of elimination and try to figure out why the wrong answers are wrong. Write on them, annotate them. You have a lot of time, so please write on them, cross them out, and say why they're incorrect for a mental check. And you could actually be helping yourself out um, to prepare for other questions that might come up. Because they might put content, um, you know, just change the spelling a few times, and then all of a sudden it's a different word, which is a different thing, which is a, wholly, a, a completely different unit. So you want to, maybe you can start to gather a few ideas there as well too. So that's a good technique. So multiple choice questions, uh, there's a lot that's hidden in there. So definitely don't leave any blank because you don't get deducted points like in an SAT or something like that. Okay, that's multiple choice for you. With short answer questions that are found in paper two, oops, and also in paper three, paper three, uh, maybe I'll make a separate video about the paper three stuff since we have three nights this year to study before paper three. But anyways, short answer questions, I'm going to give you a very short answer. They are usually very specific and often the ones that maybe cause you to be the most nervous. Essay questions, which I'll talk about in a second, you can at least choose between them so you feel like you have some control, but the short answer questions are there. And my best tip is don't leave blank spaces. Check out the number of points. So here's an example, you know, you gotta know what organelle A is. You gotta figure out that this looks like a stack of pancakes. So it must be the Golgi apparatus and that the process occurring at B is showing little vesicles, but which way are they going? The arrows are showing that they're coming inside, so this must be inside. Sounds like into endo, therefore endocytosis. So you really gotta know your stuff in order to be able to answer these ones confidently, but the worst thing you can do is leave them blank. Um, you gotta write your answers inside these boxes here. Uh, if you run out of space for whatever reason, you're trying to write Golgi app you run out of space, I think you'll be able to have a, a booklet and you can uh, actually write the rest of your answer in the booklet, but you need to make sure you identify very clearly and with all these little letters here in indentations. Question 3A, part one. You gotta make sure it's clearly uh, noted just so it doesn't get you in trouble. All right, that's short answer. On to essays.